Hola a todos, buenos días, bienvenidos. Vamos a esperar un poco, que veo que va subiendo el número de participantes. Hello everyone, welcome. Let's wait a few seconds, minutes, because participants are still checking in. So, yeah, let's wait like a little bit more. Bueno, let's go for it. Welcome everyone. Um, hola, buenos días a todo el mundo. Bienvenidos a este panel que yo creo que va a ser muy interesante porque vamos a hablar de uno de los temas candentes del momento, tecnología y educación. Eh, qué es lo que de verdad nos puede dar la tecnología y qué es lo que no nos puede dar. Welcome everyone. I think this is going to be a really interesting panel. We are going to be talking about what can really technology bring into the table when we are talking about education and what can not really bring into the table. Um, como tenemos panelistas a nivel internacional, esto es algo parecido a, a, a la, de la Liga de la FIFA, a la Copa de Naciones, lo tenemos muy parecido, pero a un nivel un poco más pequeño. Entonces vamos a tener interpretación en varios idiomas. So, we have a bunch of panelists from different places. This is a little bit like, a, like Eurovision. So, we have participants from many places and we are going to need interpretation. So, we have different channels for connecting. This channel is going to be the original channel. So the whole conversation is going to be in Spanish and English. But if you want to connect only to Spanish or English, you have a button down here that is called interpretation and you can choose your language. Entonces, este canal va a ser el canal central y la conversación va a estar en inglés y en español. Si quieren escuchar esta conversación en un solo idioma, en inglés o en español, tienen un botoncito aquí abajo que dice interpretación y se conectan al que ustedes quieran. Entonces, ahora ya simplemente voy a ir en español. Eh, por cuestiones de calidad de sonido, lo que vamos a hacer es que vamos a tener todos los micrófonos en off y si quieren hacer preguntas a los panelistas, nosotros encantados, nos los pasan por el chat. Vamos a tener el chat abierto en cualquier momento y nosotros le daremos esas preguntas a nuestro moderador. Así que es todo. Eh, disfruten y les dejo con Mercedes Mateos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Eh, buenos días a todos. Voy a pedirle a Andrea que me ayude con la presentación que tengo para este momento. And I'm going to switch to English right now. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, before moving into the panel, I would like to uh, provide a little bit of background and present a few numbers about why we started this project and why we are here today. In 2018, uh, the government of Paraguay started an ambitious process to transform their education. And in October that same year, we helped them organize an international conference with, with worldwide experts to discuss the role of technology in that transformation. Many countries uh, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean were debating at this time about the same topic. Uh, Andrea, if you can stay in the first slide, please, in the first slide. Thank you so much. So uh, many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean were debating at that time uh, about the same topic, and many were also struggling to improve student learning, expand the set of skills that were traditionally taught to new skills, such as digital or computational thinking, And overall, they were also challenged with great inequalities, both in terms of access and outcomes. Uh, there, was, there were, of course, as usual, the believers in technology and the skeptics. Uh, but what we couldn't imagine at the time was that a pandemic uh, will put all of this discussion at the forefront of the education debate and somehow move the skeptics a little bit to the believer's side by making them realize that under certain circumstances, learning cannot continue if there is no technology. And now let me quickly walk you through a few numbers to uh, contextualize what this means for the region, for the Latin American and Caribbean region. Andrea, please, thanks. 
Uh, worldwide, we know the numbers, 1.5 billion students affected by COVID-19. In LAC, about 154 million students between 5 to 18 years old had to stay at home. Uh, to this number, we should, of course, add those that are now in pre-primary or kindergarten that are not accounted in this, in, this, in this number that I just mentioned. Most of the countries had to close the schools, and many children and youth were left without access to remote learning. The question is, what does it mean in academic terms? That means that many students lost schooling uh, for half a year, and unfortunately, we are still counting, that many students will not come back to school because they lost motivation to continue. They were put to work for economic reasons in some of the cases, in many cases. In a context in which pre-COVID, we already had about 60% of low-income students attending secondary education. Our studies today estimate that about 1 million students will drop out due to COVID-19. This also means in academic terms that depending on the estimates, we are facing a great learning losses that will translate into increased socioeconomic inequalities because whereas high-income high income students continue their learning journey, the learning stuff for low-income students. We could be talking about uh, two years differences in learning between poor and rich kids. The learning loss accumulated during this period could also be associated with a potential individual income loss of around 6% of more. And some estimates at the World Bank, uh, OECD has also done some ransom estimates, talk about 10 trillion loss of lifetime earnings for the future generation, the generation that is now today studying at school. Um, so we know that the challenge is great. This is a learning crisis. And in contrast, the question is, where are the countries ready for that? COVID arrived in a context of underdevelopment, not just in the region, but around the world. These are the numbers. Global education and training expenditure is today a more than a six trillion industry. However, and, and, and the estimates also tell us that education expenditure in the next 10 years will increase, will grow to 10 trillion. This will be one of the fastest, we are, we are still in the previous slide, uh, Andrea, thank you. Uh, this is gonna be one of the fastest growing sectors. However, and compared to other industries, the ed tech represents only a very small portion of the global education market, less than 3%, which means that there is a still a lot of room for growth and which also indicates that the sector has a clearly incipient degree of development for the size of the challenges are, we are facing and compared to similar industries. Given those circumstances, many countries around the world, but in particular in the region, had to go to low tech solutions to keep the schooling going, such as radio and TV. And finally, and Andrea, you can now move to the next slide, and this will be my third point. Is the COVID story in education the same for everyone, for every country? And the answer to that question is no. It wasn't and it isn't. And this is what we are going to discuss here today. Next slide, please. Uh, only in Sweden, is school, uh, schools remain open for everyone. And this is important. This is an important point because they didn't need to face the challenge of remote learning because the physical space was still open, or at least not to the extent of the other countries. In other countries, as we, as we can see in the, in the slide, uh, schools closed in some reopened. Uh, they went back and forth. In Korea, and we were just uh, discussing previously to, the, to this with the panelists in Korea, they had to close and open about, and, and they, they open partially the same in Uruguay. But the most important part here is that uh, even if, the, even if the, the space was closed, uh, some countries were able to maintain the learning beyond the physical space of the school. When the virus hit, they went through short inter interruptions on the next slide, I think it's uh, now, Andrea, thank you. Uh, short interruptions and were able to reestablish the service of education quickly. Next slide, please. 
In lab, however, and this comes from a study that is uh, under publication, is under review and publication right now uh, from the education division. Uh, many countries, however, with the exception of Uruguay, had to keep the schools, the physical spaces closed. Uh, in some of these cases, in some of these countries, even if the public schools are open, the private schools decided to close and study remote learning because they could do it. Many families uh, in the public school, however, network are not taking the kids to school, even if they are open, which is creating large differences in learning between rich and poor, as we mentioned before, adding to the existing, pre-existing gaps. In the event in those countries that the public schools decided to close, the lack of maturity of their ed tech systems will make remote learning impossible. In those countries where schools are closed for the same reason, lack of maturity of ed tech, many kids have been left without access to education. Let's look now the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Let's look at these differences in learning environments between low and high income kids. We are talking about, and this data comes from uh, PISA 2018, uh, we are talking about gaps in access to inputs, uh, connectivity and computer uh, between 50 to 70 percentage points. So now, in those cases where education was reestablished quickly, what was the role that the maturity of ed tech sector played uh, in that country? Was technology enough? Or did they have other conditions or enabling factors to ensure learning continuity under any circumstances? What are the limits of what technology can and cannot do for education? This is what we discussed in the book uh, that you can access by the way online. But, but for now, let's hear what the countries, uh, to country experts have to say. Pablo. Perfect, thank you. Let's go with this. Millions of parents across the country are sure. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mercedes. So now we go with the panel. Marcedo, please go ahead. It's your turn. Thank you, Pablo. I, I think that I have open mic. I do. Um, so uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we are happy to, to have you here in this conversation. Uh, this is a truly global panel. We already anticipated that. I'm going to introduce them very quickly. Uh, Mr. Oli Pekka Heinonen uh, from Finland is the director uh, the general director, I'm sorry, of the Finnish National Agency for Education and a former Minister of Education in Finland. Uh, Oli, welcome. Are you there? I, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for being here. Uh, from Uruguay, Leandro Folgar is the president of the Plan Ceibal, uh, the national egg strategy, egg tech strategy that you might know in Uruguay. His expertise is in active learning methods and learning environments of the 21st century. I might add, too, that Plan Ceibal became uh, very, very shortly, uh, days ago, uh, a new member of the 21st Century Skills Coalition led by, by the IDB. So we're happy to have you here. Leandro, are you there? Hi, uh, I'm happy to be here too, uh, and yeah, to have this interesting conversation. Thank you, Leandro. Uh, from Korea, Ms. Suin Lee uh, is the co-founder and CEO of uh, NUMA, a net tech company based in Seoul and Berkeley. Uh, it offers uh, learning apps which empower all children, including those with special needs and limited resources to become independent learners. I have a note here uh, to say that the Numa's uh, Kid Kid School is the co-winner of the Global Learning X Prize competition. That's a big achievement. Uh, Suin was named also a Shrub Foundation Social Entrepreneur by the, of the Year 2020 and also uh, an Ashoka Fellow. So Suin, 
thank you for being here. It's, it, it, we're very happy to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. And we love your background. We already commented on that. So we, we're going to uh, eventually copy you. Uh, 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 last but not least, Mr. Richard Culata uh, from USA. Uh, Richard is a, it's a friend of us. He's the CEO of the International Society of, for Technology and Education, EAST, and a former director of the Office of Educational Technology in the U.S. Department of Education under the Obama administration. Uh, by the way, Richard, I have to say, too, that your background is nice. Uh, we don't see it now. I don't see it now. But uh, it's not as nice as uh, Suin. Not, not as nice as Suin. She, she know, has me beat, so but I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. You did your best, so we, we appreciate that. So uh, let, let's go to the conversation very quickly. Uh, so uh, four different perspectives from different countries. I, I need to take advantage of that. So let's, let's start with, with Suin and think about what happened to Korea during the crisis, what's going on right now, and, and what was the evolution of that. So education system open, close. What's going on today? Um, so like other COVID responses, um, Korea's centralized system and really well-trained human capital were the great um, response to overall COVID crisis, including education. So uh, the schools are reopening right now, but it's still partial. So children go to school only once or um, twice per day, except for the um, sixth, the, the what it is, 12th grade that is preparing the, the school exam. So in the sense of uh, delivering education, the, all the infrastructure Korean government has developed like um, the education TV channel and all the online infrastructure and other method that is delivering between teachers to parents are working really greatly. But because they respond really well, now we can see the shadow and, and left behind people in this really well-maintained system. Great. I'm going to ask you later for sure uh, about that. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, Oli, uh, Oli uh, we, we discussed a little bit about Finland and what was going on today in Finland. Mercedes showed there the, the situation of, of close uh, schools actually open. So I want to ask you about uh, the, the current situation. How do you got to the current situation? Um, yes, we were, we had schools closed for eight weeks in Finland. Um, but what happened here and what we are really happy with is the fact that the learning never stopped. Mm -hmm. So we were able to move in two days from schools to distance learning. And then we came back to school for the two last weeks of May. And now this, the, the fall semester has been open and 99% of the Finnish schools are open now. The 1%, there's guarantees because of the COVID-19 cases and so on. Um, I, I would say that there have been effects on the distance learning moment because some children were kind of suffering from the issue that they might have had kind of problems at home or their kind of self-managing skills were not that good that they could keep up. But we also saw uh, students who were flourishing like never before. Hmm. So the kind of effects are very diversified. I have so many questions about that, the flourishing and the uh, lagging behind. I'm gonna back, go back to you in the second, in the second round of this uh, conversation. Richard, uh, I, I always thought uh, the US should be a very heterogeneous system. Uh, you know, it is by definition. You, some, you have so many districts here with uh, the capacity to, to act independently. Yet, it seems to be that in the US you have a very, a quite homogeneous response to the issue. Uh, would you concur with me or, or is that my impression? Uh, so I would say we had a homogeneous response. That okay. is now changing. All right. So every day we're now seeing a, a real dispersion and we have, we, we, we had everybody online, uh, really across the board. And now you're seeing three groups. We have a group that is online, uh, we have a group that's in a hybrid situation, so some days in school, some days at home, and then we have schools that are back to, to full full day normal school again. So it's a real mix here. 
Thank you, Richard. I'm going to go back to that too. I promise, uh, uh, Leandro, Leandro, Uruguay was the first one to actually open schools in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, you started with rural schools, I remember that much. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, how do you see it working so far? Uh, how you, uh, and, and my, my main question is, how do you treat uh, issues of uh, COVID? Uh, when, when COVID shows up in, in one school, one district, how do you manage that? Well, um, actually, the the response in Uruguay had to do with we, we had all students uh, connected very very soon when we had to close schools, but at the same time we um, saw that there were some groups that weren't benefiting in the same uh, way from the uh, tools available. So, with the perspective of of social uh, trying to take into consideration, yeah, social vulnerability perspective, we reopened uh, as many schools as, as we could. In terms of what happens when uh, a COVID case arises, so far we haven't had a lot of them, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's good news, but we have strict protocols in, in terms of how we um, make the follow-up of the cases and all the predictive um, let's say contagious rate for for that uh, social group within the school, but we don't 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 close the school uh, if there aren't too many cases. Leandro, you are there, so I have to ask you. Uh, so you said the tools that were available. Uh, did you have to, or did you have the time, or the inclination, or the need to actually develop new tools during the during the pandemic? in order to answer when the, clo the schools were closed? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. And actually we had, um, we guaranteed at least the connection between uh, students and teachers. That was our main concern at first. But when we um, realized that students weren't benefiting from the tools in the same way, we developed, yes, a TV strategy, radio, and we, it evolved into a transmedia approach, trying to uh, move those students who weren't uh, taking advantage of the platforms in the same way to this ecosystem, and also trying to um, generate a all new way of um, professional development so that our teachers could uh, accompany that situation. Uh Leandro, I'm going I'm to take advantage of that to go to, to Oli again. Oli, you said those that were flourishing and those that were lagging behind. So Ian said something like that too. So we're going to get into that conversation. So for those that were uh, lagging behind, uh, what kind of strategy did you see working there? Well, uh, the thing that we have now kind of concentrated on is that the government has given actually extra finances for the schools to take care for the kind of gaps that were created during the distance learning period, whether they are kind of on, on learning or whether they are on kind of social skills and abilities and so on. So we are very strongly now in schools kind of concentrating to bridging those gaps because equality is by far the most important principle in the Finnish education system. So let, let, me, let me turn around the question. So for those that were flourishing, uh, I, I, is there any plan for the future to actually keep yeah. uh, that setup that made them flourish? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Because of course, some of the parents also who noticed that their kids were flourishing, were kind of saying that, hey, let's keep this up. Distance learning is functioning much better. And um, my answer to that is that I understand that viewpoint, but the question is that we have to change the school in order that they can flourish there. Quite often there are kind of challenges with bullying or kind of uh, social connecting that are the reasons why they are feeling kind of anxious in the school environment and we have to get rid of those things. But I think this has grown up the or, or brought up the very important question that whether school is a place or a service. So let me, let me ask you the same question actually, because uh, you, you, you hinted already 
at the issue of those that were left behind. But before I ask you that question, uh, a curiosity, I mean, it seems to be from your, from your description that in Korea we're talking about, about a very centralized system, okay? Which, you know, protocols are clear, uh, norms are clear, processes are clear. Uh, how do you square a centralized system with one that has to make response almost school by school if, you know, the virus shows up? How do you, how do you manage that tension? Mm, so your question is how um, the government is managing the, the schedule of students, right? The question is whether when you have a school, I mean, we, we talked to Oli a little bit earlier, remember, and the conversation there was, you know, we give some, com we, some leeway to schools to decide whether they should open or not, alter their schedules, et cetera, et cetera, because yeah. they know what's going on at that level. Yeah. How do you square that with a centralized system? That is working well. <laughs> so the centralized system actually provides a schedule and protocol that is actually flexible to school situation Got it. and each city's condition. So the, there is good thing about the centralized system, but it also builds up really uh, high pressure on already very intensive Korean education system. So some children and some parents actually need are really struggling to keep up all the speed and additional homework and assignment in ever-changing schedules of school while and they all worry about their children's exam score even under this situation got it so now those that are left behind those that are flourishing how how, how do you manage that so in so I, I'm, I'm actually focusing on children who are struggling in learning. So maybe yeah. uh, this is a bit unfair about how well Korea is managed overall. Uh, so recently there was a really interesting data from Korea. So in children's midterm exam, the top group actually accelerated their score uh, compared to last year because totally freed by school's constraint they can do their own self-learning or get uh, help from tutor and parents. But mid-level uh, students who usually learn from school and gain the most from the school system actually um, show decline of their wow. score. And the bottom group is just, just miserable because teachers are actually struggling to wake up them in the morning. <laughs> so. In Korea, there was some discussion uh, as a role of school, as an equalizer of social system. So it actually lowered down a top student who can pull the, all the resources from the world to some, some level and also boost the mid-level student into certain level uh, all together with teacher's help. And right now, without that, we worry about the large gap as all other countries do. That's, that's excellent. So, in, uh, Richard, I'm sure that you're thinking about this. Uh, so, uh, we, and let me ask you this question. So, we might emerge from this conversation, from this uh, struggle that we are going through, with uh, you know, more unequal systems, in which actually technology helped those that were enabled. And you know, basically, the lack of technology, or the lack of connectivity, or the lack of resources, uh, uh, or social capital, uh, you know, condemned those that are at the bottom. So is that uh, unavoidable, Richard? Yes, is the answer. It is completely unavoidable, but it will not happen unless we take very specific action. So technology is interesting, right? One of the things that I always talk about is technology um, is an accelerator and it will accelerate whatever you apply it to. So if we apply it to practices that close traditional equity gaps, it will accelerate uh, equal opportunities for education. If we apply it to practices that are ineffective practices, that it will do the exact opposite. And it rarely sits in the middle. So it's almost always either making more opportunities and making learning more accessible or creating greater divides faster. And that depends almost entirely on how we implement it. And so I'm super nervous. You know, one of the things that we focus on at ISTE is doing a lot of work on teacher training. Like that is really our focus is how do we help teachers be prepared? I'm super nervous because we work in 75 countries around the world. And when we're talking to country leaders, to school leaders, 
huge amounts of budget, huge amounts of budget are going to buy devices. They're going to buy hotspots. And I'm glad, I'm glad that we're finally getting connectivity, but a fraction of the money is going to preparing teachers for how to use it. And when you do that, it is a recipe for increasing divides. And you have to invest equally in the people side of the equation if you want to use this technology to uh, increase opportunities and close those divides that we see everywhere. Super. I'm going to ask you about platforms in a moment because I think that that's the other uh, ingredient that we'd like to explore with, with you guys. But uh, Leandro, I saw you, you know, saying yes. So I, I, I can ask you, I need to ask you the same question. Is this unavoidable? And think about the Latin American context too. Help us with that. With that. It is unavoidable. And, and Richard is some point in terms of um, the, 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 the why and the what uh, behind the access to technology. I mean, Uruguay is the best example in that, in that matter. I mean, we have a great access to technology and some, some people here are surprised on how we're not getting better in terms of uh, learning outcomes or um, teacher-student relationships. So we, we, had, we have to do better on that aspect and, and countries should uh, have this holistic approach. I mean, it's connectivity, success, is, uh, uh, device, devices are, are a fundamental part of it, but professional development, a, a blended approach, what's the best combination of technology and pedagogy uh, are huge issues uh, that we should address. And, and, and that's, that's a, a big point. And in many countries of the region, we are trying with CEPAL uh, in collaboration with many organizations to help as much as we can in terms of uh, trying to have different, um, let's say services so that we can give some of the information we have um, gathered and also help others not to uh, repeat some of the mistakes we, we made. Thank you, uh, Le Leandro, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Oli uh, uh, and Suin, I'm gonna ask you the same question to you guys because uh, if, if we look about you know, simply PISA, you see uh, uh, Korea and, and, and Finland uh, at the top of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the pack there. So uh, uh, my question for you guys is if, whether there's a fear to change. I mean, I, I would surmise that uh, COVID, brought a lot of opportunities for change, force on the systems, okay? Uh, and, and I think that only you were hinting at that. Uh, being successful and learning, and be, having been, been learning a lot from what COVID brought, is there a fear of change? Is, 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 can, you, can you see your systems going to the adoption of more technology, more individual learning? I know, I know that they, they are not the same, okay? But do you see, the, the forces of change is there working on very successful systems that had nothing to, they had a lot to lose and probably no, nobody knows how much to win. So Oli, can you take that one first? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I would say that the history have taught us that if we would have not changed, we would not be here today. And we know that if we won't be changing, we will not be successful in 20 years time, that, that is for sure. And actually we are working closely with countries like um, South Korea, Singapore, Canada, uh, Estonia, which are all doing well in PISA, trying to find out that how should we change? And on that kind of a cooperation, Technology is one of the biggest issues that we see that kind of makes the kind of a paradigm change in, in education happen. And another point I would like to make um, is the fact that in Finland, the teachers are very autonomous. They have a lot of room of, and they are responsible of the learning and teaching, what materials uh, what, what kind of devices they are using, what are the pedagogical solutions and so on. And that means actually that they are developers. They have a kind of a developer identity. And that of course made it possible 
for us in two days to shift from school-based learning to distance learning because the teachers took the responsibility. Thank you, Ari. Suin, same question, fear of change. Now in Korea, uh, the government uh, usually plan technology adaption to education very aggressively. Uh, and right now, Korean government come together with industrial industry and, and the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Technology come together for a more aggressive digital education transition plan. But I'm a software developer, especially dealing with children who are left behind, children who are uh, less access to all those um, learning opportunity. So we actually try to demonstrate the uh, self-learning solution for early literacy um, for immigrant families and low-income families right now, and testing and uh, implementing right now to demonstrate to the government the potential of digital technology to close the gap and support the most vulnerable learners with those technological tools. So I believe that uh, what the government, many of government, including Korean government, try to deploy more aggressive digital transition on their K-12 system. But uh, there is a fear that another uh, failure and uh, without the enough support from ecosystem like software developers mm -hmm. and innovators, all the uh, tech infrastructure developers, so that will be a really good question that how uh, developers like us can collaborate with these new system seekers and policy makers to build a better system compared to what is uh, what we have right now. That's an excellent question. And I'm going to take it for Richard, if you don't mind. OK, I'm going to adopt that question for Richard. Richard, uh, you, you work quite a bit in the you know, overlapping between public and private uh, companies uh, that are working on ed tech. And, and how they can serve the, the public education better. Uh, so uh, are we gonna see a different conversation moving forward after the COVID? I know that this is a futuristic question and I'm, I'm sorry for asking it, but it's Sue In's fault, it's not mine. Don't be sorry for asking, I'm glad you are. Look, I, I am one of these people, I gotta say, I'm actually really optimistic about what the future looks like. I think, so, so I've spent my whole career studying innovation, right? Mm -hmm. I just, I've looked in different settings. It's, it's, I'm a nerd, that's what I do. And one of the things that you see over and over again is that innovation blooms after a crisis. Right? And we see that over and over. And one of the things that, that we see in education is we have this huge crisis right now. It's, it's been this kind of very disruptive moment. Um, but on the heels of this, <laughs> I think we have the opportunity to really question some of the problems that we've dealt with for a long time in education. I know when I talk to school leaders and, and country leaders, one of the things they tell me is they say, you know, there are things that we were never allowed to question before, like how long the school day should be, or does everybody have to be in the classroom at the same time? Or uh, can we be using expert teachers that are not physically in our building if we don't have expertise close by? We were never allowed to ask those questions before. But now all of a sudden we're allowed to, and we've done some of that. And so I actually believe that we have the opportunity there, you know, again, in, in English, we say um, silver linings, right? Um, and, and I think there are some really important opportunities that we can take advantage of. And, and we'll probably look back on this moment and say, this is one of the best things that has ever happened in education. Even though it's super painful right now, mm -hmm. I think in hindsight, it will be a, a moment that has really made some change that has been needed for a very, very long time. So let me ask you to do that prediction, to make that prediction for the U.S. Uh, uh, specifically. Uh, specifically, you know, I, 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 I'm on the more on the for the U.S. and for the rest of the of the countries. No, I'm a more a little bit more on the pessimistic side. I, you know, I wake up at night thinking, you know, we might be losing on an opportunity, and we might end up on January of next year being on the same position that we were on January of last year. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so let me add to that. So this is important is I think we underestimate the amount of momentum that the old school system has, right? There is huge momentum that will be pulling us back to where we, where we 
were. And, and one of the, the worst things, honestly, the worst thing that can happen out of all of this COVID moment is if school in January 2021 looks like school did in January 20. And, and, and you guys, that's on us. Like we have to make those changes. And, and Marcelo, you talked about the, the role of technology and technology companies. We're seeing lots of good innovation happening. We're seeing products that are much more usable, much easier to use, much, much more helpful, right? But again, it, it's not, it, it is hugely dependent on how we as education leaders choose to use those tools. And if we use them in the right way, I really do think we're at an inflection point. If we don't, we do have this risk that the old, the, the old habits will, will drag us back to where we were in January 20. Super. Leandro, I, we discussed this many times, so I'm going to do it public now. Uh, so you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about whether we can emerge from this crisis with a totally different understanding, or at least a, a, an important different understanding of, of the system. I don't want to say radical because radical comes, you know, a little bit too optimistic there. Go ahead, please, Andrew. Um, I am optimistic by nature, let's say. All right. So I am optimistic and I am seeing evidence also uh, trust, but also check, you know. So um, in, in terms of things happening here in Uruguay, for example, the program Seibal en Casa is not going anywhere after the pandemic. Seibal en Casa, which is a program through which we want to uh, make learning um, opportunities available for every family in the country, besides school, if, if schools are open or closed, uh, is going to continue because parents um, really valued it, students valued. We saw some students flourish, as uh, Oli was saying, uh, in that setting. Also, there are many transmedia efforts and this uh, new way of thinking of pedag the pedagogical approach in every single setting of the school system. So I'm optimistic. I think, too, that the, uh, it's, it's good to hear that Richard thinks we are underestimating the momentum. That's also very optimistic. So I, I want to think like that also for the Uruguayan case. Uh, I, I think that we should design for that innovation, for the acceleration of that innovation. I think that um, authorities in education should be designing certain structures so that we can accelerate those bright spots that we are seeing everywhere. Thank you, Leandro. I, you know, I, I, I'm turning into 15 minutes towards the end of our conversation, and I have so many questions here from the audience, so I'm going to use them because they're much better than mine. So uh, I'm going to start with you, Oli, with this question from Robert Chatfield uh, that says, would the panel, that is to say, would you uh, agree that th this situation, the situation in which we are now, represents a punctuated, pu punctuated I'm sorry for the pronunciation there, punctuated equilibrium? Education will never be the same again, and that is a good thing. We will enter an area of mass customization in terms of delivery. And how do we achieve that without leaving the poor student behind? Uh, the, the mass custom customization that uh, uh, Robert talks about here is the opposite of what I saw in my several trips to Finland. So uh, I, I want to I challenge you there. Uh, do, you, do you agree with, with Robert there? Uh, um, yes. Um... I would agree. Uh, I think it's very difficult to think that we would go back to something after the, the COVID-19 might be over. Uh, I think ha it has kind of showed us a new direction. Um, and one thing that is, has been very clear is that now we've seen that how strong the interconnection between well-being and learning is. That if the well-being is not there, the learning won't happen. And this kind of means that we have to find ways to take the kind of personal needs of well-being and learning better in the kind of focus in our schools. But that is not actually contradictory to the idea that if we want to achieve kind of deep learning, then learning together is very powerful. So the kind of learning community still means a lot. And at the same time, we should be able to personalize the, the learning. So, so they are not opposing issues, but could be met simultaneously. 
Thank you, Richard. Uh, you, you were nodding, so I, I'm going to ask you why you were nodding on that one. Look, one of the things that I think we've seen, I just completely agree, and, and we talk a lot about, in some countries, use the term whole child. You may mm -hmm. have heard the whole child, right? Which is just this idea that you can't pretend that there isn't a life with this kid that, is outside of, that isn't outside of the five minutes that you have them in your classroom. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've often said is the least equitable thing we do in education is treat everybody the same, right? We're not the same. We know that students have very different needs and inputs and, and interests and challenges. And so to act like to treat them all the same is the least equitable thing we can do. But it's hard. It's hard in a classroom. In a traditional classroom, it's very hard. I used to be a teacher. I had 30 kids sitting in a classroom. I was in high school, so I had six classes of 30 kids sitting in, in a high school. It's very hard to customize in an environment like that. All of a sudden, in, a, in an environment where technology is infused, if done correctly, it starts to allow us more options to adapt and adjust and actually take into account the, the needs and interests of students beyond these, you know, 20 minutes that we're teaching a lesson. And that's a muscle that we have just gotten very weak in, in our education system and we'll have to, have to get used to it. Look, I have a kid right now that the worst thing, the worst thing that I'm gonna have to do is when I say, you now have to go back to, to learning in the classroom. Wow. Because this very custom moment, she has teachers that are doing a great job of tailoring to her needs and it is wonderful. And I worry that, that if we don't figure out how to bring that back with us to the classroom, we will lose, we'll, we'll go back to that moment where we're forgetting about the whole, the whole child. So in, I'm gonna make it more difficult for you, I'm sorry, because there's a question here from Laura Grassi uh, that says essentially, what are technologies out there that are accessible for, for people with disadvantage, especially with those that have uh, learning uh, differences? Uh, and and you, you talk about uh, helping them. So I want to ask you that, and I want to put on top of that, do you see technology moving to solve the problems of those people, of those groups, or do you see them more moving into the mass customization that uh, uh, I think that was Richard was talking about before? Robert, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a long question. A long I know. Question. So I will just uh, discuss about three things. Go ahead. One, um, our company actually work for delivering self-learning software for basic literacy and math for developing countries for the last five years uh, during the Global Learning X Prize competition period. And we proved that uh, children in out of school children in rural Tanzania can learn basic reading, writing, math with tablet device only within 15 months of period. So that is a really great uh, achievement. We are really proud of that. And suddenly, after the COVID-19, we realized the importance of the critical infrastructure. It's not just Wi-Fi. So we don't need Wi-Fi, but mm -hmm. it's not just device. It's a, it's a community. It's a safety. And it's a, it's a will to just make some of advancement on that vision. So that's, we believe that technology is ready. But the problem is how we can solve all those more important question of um, infrastructure and motivation of the system to adapt to this type of software and improve the learning outcome. That is a one. Uh, for vulnerable learners, there are many different types of vulnerable learners, mm -hmm. like children with special needs, children from immigrant families, um, or children who are just left behind when they come to, from when they come to the school system. So some of the learners can um, be supported with really great adaptive software, personalized lear learning solution. So we are testing a solution for immigrant families with bilingual support. And we um, also help children who come to school without much preparation by having all the preschool and kindergarten courses for first grade um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. There are many tricks but without enough requirement from the government. Actually, we, there is no um, incentive for us to have all those accessibility features like uh, sign language translation for children with hearing loss. It is all possible if somebody order them. 
But it's so rare to see any government or policymakers who can imagine that level of accessibility and inclusion in digital technology. And also the other thing is uh, seeking the best software for their own learner, their own language group is also really important. But not many people still see the value and idea of adapting the best software to their learners in their mother tongue and their culture. It is all possible if we dream. So I just want to emphasize that if there is a high uh, needs and demand clear requirement and investment, mm -hmm. there are several software developers, including us, who are willing to deliver and have a same goal of spreading the best quality technology to all students in the world. But the question to policymakers to this ground is, what are you looking for from the mm. technology? Perfect. So investment, uh, the, the issue of identifying solutions out there, but also, and most importantly, what kind of objectives you have, and, and that makes explicit. Super clear. You, you made a very good answer to a very difficult question and, and probably too long. In, in any case, Leandro, I have one for you here. I'm, I'm going to switch to Spanish for a second simply because my translation capacities at this point are not as good as I would like to be. So uh, this is what Patricio Lagos is, está preguntando. ¿En qué ámbito de la competencia digital debe estar focalizada la formación de los profesores, profesoras? ¿Cómo ha sido la experiencia de los diferentes países? Voy a preguntarte por Uruguay y te pregunto por otras cosas que has visto, en políticas de formación en competencia digital en el contexto de la pandemia? Well, that's uh, a very good question. Um, in terms of dig digital competencies, um, I mean, we have a, a huge challenge in terms of how do we uh, generate professional development programs that um, serve to those uh, teachers who are serving right now and future and then for future generations of teachers trying to predict somehow the way things are going to be evolving so that within their own professional development programs they can also design have this new skill this new ability of thinking how they have to uh, update their skills in terms of uh, digital transformation and the meaning of digital citizenship in general. Because we have a broader um, perception of, of what um, digital community is, what digital skills are, and what digital citizenship means in every context. It's different from, for Uruguay, Korea, Finland, and, and, and the US. In, just to make reference of the, of the panelists now, uh, right here. What we are trying to, um, the, the, the path that we are trying to walk here is uh, paying attention, paying a lot of attention to international community. Mm -hmm. And for example, ISTE here is, is, is doing a, a great service, but there are other organizations too. I think that the, the international community, this sense of uh, joint effort, is, is the best way to approach um, at least the curation of a digital citizenship curriculum for uh, professionals of education. Thank you, Leandro. Uh, I'm going to re-ask re you this, this part. Uh, do you think that we're asking, uh, I mean, the, the ownership of their, the, the, their the teacher's demand for this kind of digital education or digital uh, uh, training. Uh, are we asking the teachers for, for too much if we let them uh, decide individually what they need? Is, is something, do we need something that is massive and, and permanent? I think that we should get to know our teachers better. Every organization in the world who serves teachers and students should rebuild their strategies to know our teachers and our uh, teacher students better. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is teachers showed us that, that uh, they, they have the, the capacity, they have the, the possibilities. I mean, in, in Ceibal here, we have right now 9,000 teachers getting ready uh, using our 
benefiting from our uh, online courses, blended models, and we are listening to them all the time. They are doing it. They are asking, they are requesting, they are building with us if we give them the space uh, for doing so. So, I mean, they have the capacity to um, think of themselves for the teacher 4.0 or, or whatever number we are right now uh, in, in the development. But um, at the same time, we have to be sure that we have a quick channel for feedback, mm. for getting to know what they are needing in, in this specific time and with the digital context that we built for them. Because every educational system is going to build a slightly different uh, blended model uh, with a great diversity, which is exciting, but at the same time, challenging. Very challenging. Thank you very much, Leandro. Uh, Oli, uh, from Stephanie Hall here, I have a question uh, that I want to ask you. It's, uh, uh, are there examples from any of the case countries of good guidance for schools when partnering with ed tech companies? And she asked also, should there be rules around costs to the schools of amount of school funds that are shifted to such providers? Uh, the whole conversation about schools and technology companies, and, and, and I guess that I'm asking you for the Finnish perspective, but also any, any other cue that you might have for us. Well, well I think that, for example, my role as, as heading the, the National Agency for Education, my role is to kind of uh, bring together the whole kind of uh, digital learnings ecosystem the different partners so that actually we can together to decide that what are the principles and rules that we are working together so so cause cause if we kind of do our job in our silos we will not get kind of sustainable solutions the the implementation won't be there the, the kind of everyday reality of schools is such that there is such a hurry all the time and, and, and there are so many things to do that if you try to push, it won't work. So, so there needs to be a kind of a uh, continuous discussion. Uh, we in Finland have a system that the, the school providers, which are mostly municipalities in Finland, they are responsible of the kind of um, content and the platforms and the connections. So it's their point of view to, to kind of uh, to, to make those investments. And in doing that, they have to be sure that they are treating all the different actors similarly. Thank you, Oli. Uh, uh, for you, Richard, now, uh, so I'm, I'm trying here to translate and says essentially uh sí, but you know que aprendizajes consideran que se han potenciado en el contexto de la pandemia the question is about mm -hmm. social emotional skills and mm -hmm. whether you can teach them using technology or not yeah i mean this this actually ties to the question you're asking leandro you know hace unos segundos porque it's it's really um we talk about digital citizenship, right? La ciudadanía mm -hmm. digital. But mm -hmm. when we say digital citizenship, what it almost always looks like is don't share your password, <laughs> don't upload a picture that's inappropriate, don't be a jerk online, right? But that is such a narrow slice of what it means to be a, a digital citizen. I mean, imagine if that's what we taught real citizenship, right? Like, just don't steal things and don't beat people up on the street. That's all you have to do to be a citizen. No, of course not, right? And so we need to make sure when we talk about digital citizenship or ciudadanía digital, that we're talking about the full version of it. It means knowing how to engage with somebody who may have a different uh, belief than you do in a virtual space and do it respectfully and know how to recognize not just true and false information, that's actually pretty easy, even though we all struggle with it, but recognize bias that's in digital information. Um, learn how to use digital tools in digital spaces to improve your community, 
to make the world around you a better place. Those are all of the skills. And yes, of course, online safety. We do want you to be safe online. <laughs> but I think that's the thing is that we've just gotten very narrow in our definition of, of, of digital citizenship. And we have to, you know, we have to expand it. We have to ampliarlo because it's got to include, as, as we move, we're moving the most important experiences of our lives to the digital world. All of the most important moments that we have, many of them are now happening in a virtual space, but we're not teaching how to be good digital people. And that's something that is going to come back to hurt us if we don't get ahead of that and start being much more thoughtful about how we teach digital citizenship. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that digital citizenship is what we're doing by uh, starting on time and also finalizing the conversation on time. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be a good uh, digital citizen. Uh, so in, thank you very much uh, for, for being here. It was a real pleasure, great conversation. Oli, uh, thank you also for your generosity in, uh, in sharing your, your experience. And Leandro, as always, uh, for being a, a permanent partner with, with the IDB. And Richard, I, I don't have uh, any, any more to say that other than, you know, we learn quite a bit from you and, and we admire your organization as well. So uh, thank you very much to all, everybody in the audience and, and we'll hope to see you soon. And please uh, take care of yourself. Take care. Bye.